Start basketball. Hey, hoop heads! Wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user friendly machines on the market, and they truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Also, make sure to check out the new Dr. Dish Home Machine, which is perfect for these crazy times when gyms and schools are closed. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hey, this is Brendan Winters from Pro Skills Basketball, and you are listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all-new FastDraw and Fast Scout. FastDraw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years, and now with its integrated web platform, coaches have the ability to add video to plays and share them directly to their players' Android and iPhones via their mobile app. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. In addition to a great product, they also provide basketball coaching content and resources through their blog and play bank. For access to these plays and more information, visit FastModelSports.com or follow them on Twitter at FastModel. Put your effort and time into jobs that are going to be realistic to you, whether it's you have a connection or it's within your region or it's something that you sincerely feel that you're capable of doing. Brian Stanchak is the founder of the BDS Agency, which is dedicated to providing individualized and innovative management to each of their coaching clients while forming long-term relationships with them and their families. Understanding the life and demands of a Division I basketball coach himself, Brian focuses on providing a service to coaches that he would have wanted as a coach. Since 2014, the BDS agency has had 45 clients obtain a first-time or new Division I head coaching position, secured over 85 extensions or renegotiations to Division I head coaching client contracts, and negotiated over $120 million in employment contracts. Stanchek previously was the athletic director at Penn State Wilkes-Barre after spending three seasons in the Big East Conference as an assistant coach with the Seton Hall University women's basketball team. Prior to Seton Hall, Stanchek served two years as the top assistant slash recruiting coordinator with the Fairleigh Dickinson University women's basketball team. Stanchek spent the 2004-2005 season as the coordinator of basketball operations for the men's and women's team at the University of Pennsylvania, working under men's coach Fran Dunphy and women's coach Patrick Knapp. While an undergraduate at Seton Hall, Stanchek was a student assistant video coordinator for the men's basketball program, beginning under current Harvard coach Tommy Amaker. We recently launched the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels, through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Our roster of shows is growing, so don't forget to check out all our other podcasts on the Hoopheads Pod Network, including Thrive with Trevor Huffman, Beyond the Ball, the CoachMaze.com podcast, Players Court, Bleachers and Boards, The Green Light, and our team focused NBA pods Cavalier Central, Grizz and Grind, Nuck If You Buck. The 305 Culture, Blazing the Path, Hashtag Lakers, Motor City Hoops, X's and O's NBA Breakdown, Spanning the Spurs, LA Hoops, Thunderous Applause, and the Wizards Hoops Analyst. We're looking for more NBA podcasters interested in hosting their own show centered on a particular team. Email us info at hoopheadspod.com if you're interested in learning more and bringing your talent to our network. Take some notes on the business of coaching as you listen to this episode with Brian Stanchak from the BDS agency.
Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel this morning, but I am here with Brian D. Stanchek from the BDS Agency. Brian, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks for having me, man. Excited to be here. We are excited to have you on and dig into your varied background in the game of basketball, starting out in the coaching profession and shifting over to the coaching agent business. Let's start when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about your first experiences with the game of basketball. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I fell in love with game of basketball uh, pretty early, about middle school, and uh, and it played through middle school and, and some of high school, and then I realized relatively early that I was not going to get that opportunity to to play at the Division One level, and so I figured, you know, wanting to be involved in some way at that level, why not just start my coaching career while I was in high school? And so. I uh, had spoken with the, the head coach of the, the high school team, and, um, you know, I, I give him all the credit in the world for letting a 15, 16-year-old kid uh, become a part of the coaching staff and learn and, and get involved. And, and so that's, that's how I got my start in coaching. And, um, and then it was my, my goal to really just advance my career and, and coach at the Division One level. And so... Uh, one piece of advice that I got really early on was to work college basketball camps and build a network. And so while all my friends were having fun during the summers, I was staying in dorms with out air conditioning and, and <laughs> coaching basketball for eight to 10 weeks and building a network. And it was through that network that I got to know Tommy Amaker at Seton Hall and Chris Collins at Seton Hall. Um, Chris had left for to go back to Duke right before I got there, but um, had gotten to know them and uh, was fortunate enough where Coach Hamaker said, hey, you wanna come to Seton Hall? Would love to have you work with our program. And so Seton Hall was the only school I applied for. And I don't know what I would have done if I didn't get in there, <laughs> but uh, but it was my, my goal to work with, with TA and, uh, and Chris before they had left. And so uh, that that's how I got my start. So what does that look like? So two questions. Let's go back to high school for a second first. When you go in and you're a high school student and you're helping with the coaching staff, what does that look like? What were some of the things that you were doing? What were some of the things that you were able to sit on, sit in on or learn at that early stage in your career? Well, so I was fortunate where the head coach had asked me, "Hey, what do you want to what do you want to do?" And I said, "Listen, I'll, I'll I want to learn. I want to sit in on all the coaching meetings. I want to be able to go and travel and uh, produce scouting reports. I want to get on the floor and, and coach. And so what I had started doing was I started coaching with the freshman team because the freshmen were younger than me at the time when I had started coaching. And so it just gave me an opportunity to really gain hands-on experience uh, on the court coaching. And I was also coaching, you know, I'd sit on the bench for varsity games and, and uh, do some coaching there my first year. But, you know, a lot of it was with the freshman team and really just honing my craft on the court. But at the same time, I was uh, I was traveling. Even though I couldn't drive, I would go with the freshman coaches. We'd go out to different games and, and produce scouting reports. And um, we'd watch game film with the coaches after the game and, you know, just be hands-on with every aspect of, of a program. Was there anything that you remember from that time that was surprising to you as a coach? Maybe there was something that before you got into it, you thought, hmm, I didn't realize that coaches did so much of this. Or was there one particular aspect that you find particularly interesting or surprising that you didn't realize was part of coaching? Probably I was naive to the fact of how bad parents are, <laughs> uh, you know. I'll, I'll never forget, you know, the the two or three times that parents were flipping out uh, on the on the head coaches for unnecessary reasons, and so and these were, you know, parents that I knew because I was friends with their kids, and I'm like, man, this, this <laughs> it's a a side I didn't know was there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a little bit of a of an eye opener uh, for me at that point, but. You know, I think the the biggest thing in terms of the skills that go into coaching and the responsibilities are just how much work goes in to prepare for practice, prepare for a game that players 
or those on the outside don't see. Um, whether it's, you know, the hour you spend in a car to go to a game and watch it and then spend two hours watching it and then spend two hours putting together a scouting report and then discussing it as a staff. You know, these, these five to six hours before a high school game that went into it uh, to produce a 15-minute report to show the student athletes and, and talk about it at practice. So I think that I think that was probably the the greatest eye opener, but in a in a very positive way. Yeah, I could totally see that. Where I think a lot of people, especially as players, you don't necessarily realize how much time your coaches are putting in. You see them on the practice floor, you see your coach at the game, and then you're like, well, what are they doing from? 7 a.m. until 3 o'clock when practice starts. You know, I guess in high school they're probably teaching in most likely, the most likely case. But in college, I think you have a perception of, well, I'm not sure what they're doing. You know, but they show yeah. up for practice the same way, same way I do at 2:30 or 3 o'clock, and then it's just things just kind of miraculously happen. And I think yeah. inevitably I you mean, talk when to I coaches. College basketball, it was, and people would say, "What do you do?" And I'd say, "I coach college basketball," and they'd be like, "Okay, what's your full time job?" I'm like, that's, <laughs> that's my full-time job. And so it, it's more than uh, full-time, right? More. Yeah. A lot more than full-time. And, and we'll get into that, you know, in terms of why Absolutely. I, you know, stepped away from the profession. What, when you, so you're at Seton Hall and you're working with coach Amaker and you're part of the staff there and you're doing things for him. What are some of the things that you're doing? And then in the course of doing that, did you, did it cement your love for, coaching and get you to the point where you're saying, boy, now this convinces me that this is the direction that I want to go. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, coach Amaker was in and still to this day. I mean, a tremendous mentor. And I mean, he was my idol, you know, I just, everything that he did for that Seton Hall program was done in such a first class way. And so to learn from him every day was, I mean, it was a coaching clinic every single day, whether we we're in practice, uh, individual workouts or, or being in the office. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that I did for him were, um, you know, just typical managerial duties that managers would do, whether it's setting up for practice, breaking down practice, but also, you know, one of the assistant coaches kind of took me under his wing, Billy Schmidt. Um, it was an assistant who replaced Chris Collins at the time, and uh, and Billy kind of took me under his wing and, and gave me a lot of insight and allowed me to kind of help put together some of the scouting reports that he would do, um, you know, gather the, the information and stats. And, and so it gave me a real good insight into, you know, what went into the, the scouting process of, uh, of producing a, a college basketball scouting report. And so um, for Coach Amaker, I did that. After Coach left for Michigan, Lewis Orr came in. And this was back in 2001 to um, 2004. And at the time, programs didn't have specific video coordinators. It's not like it was as common as it is today. There were some programs that did it, but a lot of times – the there was a GA who might have done it, or there was an admin assistant um, that you know was specifically for basketball that would do it, um, but not as many video coordinators. And so what Coach Orr allowed me to do was he allowed me to be the video coordinator. And so I spent three years as a video coordinator, two years as uh, as the um, overseeing all the student managers, um, and so. Being the video coordinator helped me expand my network and just really add to my resume things that someone who might have just been a typical student manager wouldn't have had when they graduated. So I was really, really lucky to be able to do that. That's a little bit different job than it is today with <laughs> dealing with video. Oh, you know, man, I, the amount of times I fell asleep in the office at two o'clock in the morning because you got, you know, six tape decks rolling and, uh, and you still got, you know, 13 tapes to send out because this would be, you know, the, the non-conference games in the beginning when everyone's requesting them. I mean, it, it's crazy. Even at Penn, you know, after I graduated from Seton Hall and went on to Penn, I was doing the video work and, you know, we only had two, maybe three tape decks that we could copy onto. 
And I mean, it would take these guys today have no idea how easy they got it. I mean, the amount of time you spend in the office just making sure that you're copying tape to tape was, oh, man, I, could, I couldn't even count the hours now. Yeah, it's crazy. When you think about how much easier it is today, I think anybody under the age of 25 or 30 really has no idea. And I think about it from a coaching perspective. I think about it from a player perspective. I remember sitting and trying to watch video with our coaches when I was playing at Kent and we'd sit in the locker room and you'd want to, re you know, your coaches would want to replay a particular play. So you'd hit the rewind button. It would go like 45 seconds past the play that they wanted to, wanted to see. Yeah. And then you'd fast forward it and you'd, you'd end up seeing all this stuff. I mean, you wasted so much time. It's just amazing how much more efficient oh, we are today with digital. It's just, it's just crazy. I can't imagine what that looks like in terms of just the change in the amount of time and productivity somebody who's in that video coordinator position today versus what somebody who was doing it in the age when you were doing it. Oh, 100%. Well, I even remember, I mean, even just the live stats that they're doing now in terms of the um, the different software where, you know, you're able to code it you know, throughout the throughout the course of the game, so that way everything's picked up and able to be broken down as soon as the game's over. I mean, I remember um, there was a time my first year that the the first year Eddie Griffin, who was drafted in the NBA, and uh, I think he was drafted by the Six Nets. Uh, I think he might. Have been I think Nets, yeah, I think the Nets. Yeah, the Nets had drafted him, but Eddie was on the team and. I mean, Eddie was just getting triple double, and he was getting triple doubles with blocks, not even assists. But you know, there was a game I can't even remember how many rebounds he had. But Billy came to me and he was like, "You know, these stats are wrong. Like, there's no way Eddie only had this many rebounds." He's like, "Watch the entire game and count how many rebounds Eddie had." And I mean, I watched it. I can't remember if the stats were right or or wrong. But again, it's something you look back on and you're like, "Man, I spent two hours or." or more just watching that video where now everything is just categorized instantly and they have the, the resources, the software, the people to be able to do that to really, you know, make time much more productive. Yeah, it's incredible. Were you still driving videotapes around and doing exchanges and going to FedEx all the time? Oh, 100%. <laughs> I mean, you, like, what was the, I can't remember the place that was in Secaucus, New Jersey. Uh, there was a, a tape place where they got every game. I mean, they taped everything that was on TV and just, we were lucky because we were close. So I'd be up there all the time, you know, like having to figure out uh, when school is closed for winter break, because then when tapes were coming in over winter break, then you wouldn't be able to get them because the mail was <laughs> closed. And which coach is how she got to say, I mean, just, yeah, I, yeah, that's insane. That is absolutely was... insane. Hey, hoop heads. We all hate ankle sprains, and they happen way too often. Ankle injuries are the number one sports-related injury. Arise is trying to change that. With the iFast, your athletes get preventative protection and full mobility. Athletes no longer need to wear bulky braces that limit performance and give mediocre protection. Anyone playing sports should be using these products. Keep your athletes in the game. Don't wait for them to get hurt to take action. Visit www.arise.com, spelled A-R-Y-S-E, and use the code HOOPHEADS to get 20% off the future of performance. That's A-R-Y-S-E dot com with promo code HOOPHEADS to get 20% off. How did you balance yeah. all your responsibilities with the basketball program with your responsibilities as a student? Well, probably not very well because I spent <laughs> so much time in the office. <laughs> but it, um, I mean, I loved it. You know, I loved it. It was, I mean, it was great. I was part of something that I wanted to do for the three years prior to getting to Seton Hall. So I didn't mind the grind. Um, you know, and I, I gave up a lot during my college experience and my friends were out going to parties and, and doing different things because I was working my butt off. And so it was, it was a tough balance, but you know, I, I made it work. And that's, you know, that's one of those things that again, it, 
when when you're a student athlete, you're putting in so much work. And it was the same thing for me. You know, I I might not have been doing the obviously the, the practice work and uh, the individual workouts and whatnot, but you know, I was spending hours upon hours in the office. Um, you know, putting putting all that time in, but I knew that there was going to be an end goal to it. It wasn't necessarily I wasn't thinking about necessarily what I was doing for myself at that point and the program at that point. It was anything that I'm doing now is an educational experience that's going to help me later on down the line. Absolutely. All right. So take us through the various stops in your coaching career. Maybe just give us some highlights from each one of them, what you learned, and then we can start to move towards ultimately where you end up with BDS. Yeah. So when I had graduated, I mean, I one thing that I was always really good at was networking and just trying to develop and cultivate and maintain relationships. And so... Uh, I had developed a ton of relationships and worked in camps and then obviously through my time at Seton Hall, but I was also very proactive with things. And so what I had done was just started reaching out to a lot of the local schools saying, hey, you know, this is my background. Here's my resume. This is who I've worked for. If anything opens on your staff, we'd love to talk with you. And I got a call one day um, from Penn. And they were interviewing for a coordinator of basketball operations position. And Coach Dunphy had gotten my email that I had sent a month prior and asked him if I was interested. And I didn't know Coach Dunphy at all, um, but it was a, was a great opportunity. And so, uh, you know, I keep saying this, but, you know, I was fortunate because I had, um, I had probably like two or three other offers at the Division One level. Um, whether it was a GA spot or op spot. And, um, and so for me, it was, okay, where can I go and, and learn from, you know, one of the best there is. And, and so interviewed, got the job at Penn and, um, and it was fantastic. It, uh, we won the, on the men's side, we won the Ivy League championship, I think January, because at the time there was no Ivy League tournament. And I mean, we were, I think we lost one game that year in the Ivy League, but uh, we were beating up on everyone so bad that it was like, I mean, we still had like five or six Ivy League games to go and we had clinched the Ivy League championship. So that was certainly a a highlight and then moving on to the NCAA tournament. But where this kind of, you know, established a different path was at the time I had started working, I, I had worked with the men's and women's team when I was at Penn. So I was coordinator basketball operations for both teams. And uh, the coach that hired me, Kelly Greenberg, uh, she moved on to Boston College about a month after I got there. And Patrick Knapp, who was the head coach at Georgetown, had taken over for Kelly. And Coach Knapp really took me under his wing and really exposed me to the women's side of college basketball. And so for me, it was a side that I never really contemplated, but I also saw that the 15th kid on the roster also didn't think that they were making it to the NBA. It was much more pure. It was much more fundamental. And I really, really enjoyed uh, being able to, to experience that. And Coach Knapp gave me a lot of enhanced responsibilities as well in terms of just being able to uh, scout opponents and break down film and um, do some of the stuff that you know I needed to learn. But wasn't necessarily doing as much because I was too busy copying videotapes for film exchange. And so he was, uh, he gave me that opportunity and really took me under his wing. And so I, um, so I kind of made the decision at that point where I was going to head towards the women's side and, uh, had gotten a job at Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, and you know, I'll kind of tell this quick story because I think it's, it's important about being proactive. I mean, for me, I wasn't on the floor coaching at Penn. I was coordinator basketball operations, administrative stuff, and, you know, doing scouting behind the scenes and whatnot, but I wasn't on the floor and I knew I wanted to be on the floor. And so what I had done was I had went at the time, most third assistants, and we're still talking, you know, 2005, most third assistants were grad assistants. And so I went on the website of every school in the, the MAC and America East and 
uh, any of the kind of local Northeast conferences, and I saw who had GAs in their second year because I knew at that point they would be looking for a third assistant. And I was proactive and had emailed a bunch of uh, head coaches and one of the, I had gotten some responses, but you know, one of the ones who had written me was Sandy Gordon, who was at Fairleigh Dickinson and uh, interviewed for the job and, and was forced enough to become a recruiting coordinator and uh, an assistant coach at Fairleigh Dickinson at a really young age. And, uh, and so was there for two years and then uh, had gotten the call to go back to my old mother, Seton Hall, for three years on the women's side with Phyllis Mangina, who was you know, tremendously impactful for, for my career. And I had gotten to know while I was working at Seton Hall as a student and gave me an opportunity to come back home. What was your favorite part of your time as a college basketball coach? Which piece of it stood out to you as when you look back on it now, you say that was the part that I enjoyed the most. Does anything stand out for you? Yeah, I think just the interaction, day-to-day interaction with the student-athletes and watching them grow and develop over the course of a year to four years. I mean, you know that you're impacting lives in a positive way. So I think that is certainly meaningful as far as what i miss i mean you know i certainly miss the excitement that comes with being on the bench during a close game at the end and i think that's uh you know something that i'll always miss uh but you know it's it's funny my wife's favorite game we had played a game in the prudential center on the women's side against yukon I think we had lost by 70. She always tells, she's like, that's my favorite game you played. You played in the giant NBA arena, NHL <laughs> arena. I'm like, I'm going to the bench after the first, you know, 10 minutes of the game. That's awesome. <laughs> so that, that's not a positive memory, but, um, but it's certainly a memory. That's funny. So when you think about that time, what – what is it that you don't miss? So what was it that made you kind of rethink and reprioritize where you wanted to go with your career? What was it about coaching that made you say, hmm, maybe there's a time for me to find a better balance? Was it getting married? Was it kids? Was it just you seeing the amount of time you're spending in the office and the amount of time that's required in order to have success? Where were you in terms of your thought process when you left Seton Hall and then you go and become a director of athletics. Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of a couple things. I mean, for me, my dream was always to coach at my alma mater, and I had done that for three years before my boss Phyllis had had decided to step away, and so I had essentially reached a dream by the age of, I mean, I was 25 at the time when I had gotten to Seton Hall, 28 when Phyllis had resigned. So I, I had accomplished something that I kind of set forth, um, you know, about what, eight years earlier. So there was that. The other thing was, you have to remember, this was the old Big East. I mean, this was when, and I say it like it was so long ago. I mean, it was still, <laughs> feels a lot. Know, lo- feels a lot longer than it is, it, right? It, it does. Yeah. I mean, this was 2007, 2010, and this was when Louisville, Notre Dame, UConn were in the conference, and so we would break school records for non-conference wins, play a challenging non-conference schedule, and all of a sudden you open up and you're. 0-3 because you lost to three of the best teams in the country and whatnot. So it was, you know, it, it beat you down a little bit too. Um, you know, there was there was not much parity in terms of the conference. And so that was, you know, that, that took a lot out because you put a lot in and, and you weren't seeing all that hard work. It was, it was disappointing um, and more disappointing in terms of me taking accountability saying, man, what else could I have done to make us more successful during that period of time? And then the third thing is, yeah, as a college coach, you're not getting that personal professional balance. And I had, um, having reached my dream and having desired to have a little bit more personal professional balance that I had sacrificed through college, um, you know, through my 
years as a as a college coach, I desired it a little bit more. And so that's when I decided to, to step away and look at the administrative route. Hey, coaches, parents, and group leaders. I want to introduce you to our newest sponsor, SnapRaise. SnapRaise is the nation's largest digital donation platform built to help teams, youth groups, and clubs raise money quickly and efficiently without selling products. SnapRaise builds your group a customizable campaign website, and students use their mobile devices to connect and engage with their biggest fans. My son's high school team used SnapRaise this season, and our team raised all the money they needed to fund their season, and then some. Getting SnapRaise started is quick and free. Just visit SnapRaise.com and you'll get connected to a local SnapRaise expert in no time. So you do that and you end up at Penn State Wilkes-Barre. What does that look like for you in terms of reaching that goal of having more work-life balance? What did you like about that job and what maybe did you, I don't know if not like, but what did you miss about what you had been doing before? Well, so let's take one quick step back. What when I got out of coaching, um, everyone kept saying to me, "Hey, you got to do you got to do sales. Like you're gonna make so much money. You'll do the nine to five. And and so I wound up getting into pharmaceutical sales and did it for nine months. Became number one sales rep in the company. Uh, made more money than I ever did in my coaching career, and I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. And you know, like the day we got our big. <laughs> big commission check was the day I called my boss and I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm taking an uh, athletic director job and, and I know he was disappointed because I made him a lot of money, but it just, what I missed at that point that I didn't necessarily realize um, prior was the camaraderie that comes with being on a college campus. And so during this period of time, I was offered a couple of assistant AD jobs and um, didn't necessarily want to move very far and so had turned them down and kept looking at different opportunities and the girl I was dating at the time was my now wife um, we had started dating about two uh, after my first year at Seton Hall um, she's from the Wilkes-Barre area and so you know we were always doing the back and forth thing I was still living in North Jersey when I was doing pharmaceutical sales and uh, and just saw that Penn State needed an athletic director. And so I uh, played the process right and was fortunate enough to, to get the job over there. And it was, it was great. It was a great learning experience in terms of helping me and, forge, and forging the path that had kind of led me to where I am now. Um, I really enjoyed being back on the college campus. I really enjoyed the leadership aspect. I really enjoyed being able to create as much of a positive student athlete and coach experience as possible. But I also learned, and this goes back to the part that's not fun, is that as a, as a coach, you may be asking things of your AD and they might be saying no, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's things they don't want to do. They report to someone too, and they answer to someone too. And I learned that you know you can only be as successful as the support above you as an athletic administrator, because we had done a tremendous amount. I mean, we were setting school records for number of recruiting student athletes to the school, and, um, and our coaches were having success and, you know, buying in. And I kept emphasizing the importance of not just recruiting, but the retention part of it. And you have to invest to be able to get that long-term investment. And so it was, it was frustrating when, um, when we weren't obviously being able to get that investment that was needed to be able to not just recruit, but, but retain and create the best positive experiences possible for our student athletes. And I think we did as, as much. And one thing I say that I did for my coaches is the one thing that cost the school nothing that I did all the time was show them appreciation and make them feel valued. 
So, which we know, which uh, we know as coaches, a lot of times can be very, very isolating. And when you're not hearing was, from somebody above you or people, because you hear a lot of bad stuff as a coach, just like you talked about with parents earlier off the top of the podcast. Coaches are hearing a lot of people complaining about what they do. So I'm sure that any coach would appreciate hearing from somebody that's giving them a little bit of praise and a little bit of love for the hard work and time that they're putting in. Oh, 100%. I mean, it's, you know, I text my coaches after every game, win or lose, and, uh, and I'd be at every home game, you know, travel occasionally, some of the, the away games, but, you know, just being able to be visible and, and let them know that I'm there and supportive of them was, was big. But it also only goes so far, you know, at the, at the end of the day. And so uh, that was probably the most frustrating part of the job was, but it was also a great eye opener in terms of, um, you know, situations that I deal with now and being able to really help clients work through them with their administrators and, you know, just understand that, you know, just because your administrator says no, doesn't mean that they don't want to or they don't believe in you or that they're, they're not supportive. They ultimately have to balance things and, and answer to someone else as well. Yeah, I would imagine that learning how to lead and manage that group of coaches as a college athletic director translates pretty well to what you do as you try to manage and help the clients that you have today manage their careers. So tell us a little bit about how the idea for the agency came about and just give us the genesis story of BDS. Sure. So I had never set out to be an agent. It was not anything I thought of doing when I was a student at Seton Hall, it was the height of the Jerry Maguire era. And so everyone I feel like in my sport management major wanted to be sports agents. I wanted to be a college basketball coach. And I, I joke that right now I look back and I'm probably the only one that is a sports agent and no <laughs> one else is. And so it's funny how life takes you on these twists and turns, but it was during my time as an administrator that I had maintained communication with a lot of my friends on the coaching side uh, in women's basketball and was able to really help them through various things, whether it was their contract, interview preparation, handling situations with administrators. And a couple of them over the course of time would say, you know, you should get in the agent thing. And I'd say, nah, I no interest in doing that. And the more I thought about it, at the time, there were maybe one or two people that were focused on women's basketball. I saw that that bas women's basketball coaches were not a priority for most agents. And also, it, it wasn't a focus, there wasn't a focus for helping coaches advance their careers as much on the, on the women's side in terms of representation. And so, I felt like my experience having been a coach and an athletic administrator and then seeing obviously myself help several coaches through various things and advance their careers and contracts and sit uh, through situations as an AD, I saw that it could provide real value there. I wasn't someone who just, hey, I can make money off coaches. I'm going to become an agent like I see today. It was, you know what? I can provide real value having been on both sides of the table. Um, and I got a passion for an underrepresented sport. And so founded the agency back in 2013 and haven't looked back since. I, I wound up, um, I stayed in my AD job till 2015. I did both, uh, was able to have a little bit of success. My wife found out we were having our, our first child um, and when she found out, I said, you know, this is great, but I think I'm going to quit my AD job. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Perfect and timing, another, Brian. Another pay, yeah, take another pay cut. But I believed enough in myself and the clients I had that it was worth the shot. So I said, listen, I'll, I'll stay, you know, through, uh, through February 2015. My son was born in uh, November of, of 2014, but I said, I'll, I'll stay at Penn State. You know, that way we'll make sure, you know, God forbid, yeah, anything happens with the baby, you know, just make sure he's healthy and, and he is, he's healthy, beautiful, love my life. And, uh, and so, you know, once, yeah, once I had left in, in 
end of February 2015. Uh, been doing this full time ever since. How many clients did you have when you made the leap? And then what was the plan for obviously adding clients since you're going from it being a part time job to being a full time job? What was the expansion plan when you first got into it? Well, I think I probably had 15 to 20 clients when I had left, but what it kind of helped allow to, to build a foundation and, and understand that there was going to be a, a level of success was my first off season as an agent, five of my clients became first time division one head coaches. And so I saw there was some success. I was able to start generating some revenue. Now it was nowhere clear close to what I was making as an AD, but it was foundational enough to kind of help give me a start. And so that's, I mean, without that, if I had went that first off season and didn't have success, I don't know, I don't know what would have happened. But you know, with with that, I was just fortunate enough to work with amazing coaches who believed in me as much as I believed in them. What are the three main services that you provide to your coaches? If you had to narrow it down, what are the three most important things? If we were to ask, uh, take a survey of your clients, what would they say would be the three most important things that you do for them to help them advance and succeed in their careers? Well, I think obviously the contract negotiation and advisement is a huge part of it. I think the counseling piece of it, whether it's career or program or dealing with uh, staff or administrators, uh, whatever it might be. My wife thinks 80% of my job is being a counselor, especially <laughs> through these last couple, you know, last eight, nine months. So I think that's, uh, you know, the second piece of it. And then I think all aspects of the interview process as well. Um, is big, whether it's, you know, portfolio development or interview prep or being able to um, be strategic about pursuing opportunities that are potential for other clients. All right, let's break down each one of those one at a time. Let's start out with contract negotiations. Sure. How, do you, how do you learn what you need to do in contract negotiations? I'm assuming that you don't have a law degree, so how do you go about helping your clients in that contract negotiation piece? How did you learn the process for what needed to be done to help your clients? Well, I think with the, with the contract piece, I mean, obviously I was negotiating contracts as, as an AD. And so I had, uh, had some experience on that other side of the table, but I think, uh, the biggest part of it was that was so much that gave me a, a huge advantage was the fact that I wasn't an attorney. Because there were a lot of ADs that just didn't want to deal with it um, and deal with, with attorneys. And I think once they talked to me, they saw I was a down-to-earth guy um, who was extremely knowledgeable and fair and fought for my clients, but uh, in a way that was also not demeaning or looking to piss them off either. And so I think my approach was always really solid. But as far as the contract negotiations go, I mean, a lot of it's about data and what you can do to support your case. You know, you can't just say, I want this amount of money or this amount of years. A lot of it goes into, hey, this is what we want and this is why we want it. Um, or this is why this person deserves an extension. I try to put as much information as possible in front of them to help them make their decision for them. Um, that's, that's my piece of kind of the negotiation, but we also, I have an attorney who represents baseball coaches who looks at every contract too for me. So, you know, it's just kind of an extra set of eyes. I mean, uh, occasionally he might pick up something that I miss, but been doing it for so long that, um, there's, there's never too many issues with it, but just from a, from a legal standpoint, he always looks at all our contracts as well. Do you know where to hit the backboard for the highest percentage shots? Do you know when using the backboard is better than taking a direct shot? Be certain that you are taking the highest percentage shots by training with the shotical. The shotical mounts on your backboard to give you the location of the highest percentage shots. Train with the shotical and you will score more. Basketball is a data-driven game, so don't ignore the data and the facts. We worry about the data, 
so you can focus on shooting. Visit Shotical.com now and start scoring more. Yeah, that has to be tremendously valuable to coaches who, one, just don't have the time to be able to put in that research to get back their case for why they should be paid what they should be paid or what they're looking for in terms of a, a new position or an extension of their current contract. So I'm sure that's an extremely, extremely valuable piece that, again, coaches just don't have the time. And it's kind of like when you go in and you're buying a car from a, you know, from a car salesman, that car salesman has done hundreds or thousands of transactions and you're sitting there maybe having done three, four in your entire life. And I think that contract is probably the same way where a coach, yeah. sure, they've, you know, they've, dealt with maybe one or two situations but here's you somebody who has you know again hundreds of clients that you've negotiated hundreds if not thousands of contracts at some point that you can go in and look at it and you know what you're looking for you know the case that you have to put forth in front of an athletic director in order to make the in order to make the deal happen and to get the best deal for your client it just seems like something that every coach i'm sure when that process is done i would guess that the thank yous that you get from your from your clients uh you know are pretty heartfelt at that point yeah, no question. I mean, when I'll get, I'll get texts or calls from the spouses, you know, just <laughs> thanking me. You know? Yeah, I believe and, that. And, and that's when it's so meaningful because for me, again, I know that I was able to impact their life in a positive way. That maybe they didn't necessarily, they, 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 felt like maybe they should have been capable enough to achieve the same goal, but didn't know how to go about it or didn't know how to justify it or didn't know that it was possible. But, you know, the negotiation piece of it too is with, um, with, with clients, it's not just about the salaries because I think that's the big thing that everyone always looks at. And, you know, there are a lot of coaches who don't want to work with agents because they figure they can save money. And they might save money by going and have an attorney review it. But the attorney doesn't know about coaches' contracts. It doesn't have the data to be able to justify the uh, any asks that are in there. And so I think that one thing coaches need to take into consideration, I think it's becoming much more prevalent, are other aspects of the contract. There might be times where, yeah, we might not be able to get any more money, but maybe we'll get an extra year. That's a lot more money in your in the coach's pocket that's far going to exceed whatever they're paying me or the the additional bonuses that they might get or even just protecting them from uh, a termination with or without cause um, or a buyout if they were to go to another school, um, allowing them that flexibility. So there's a lot of uh, things that are in the contract that go outside what your base salary is that can far, that you know, an expert or, or an agent, and I felt I've done right by my clients in these areas that might far exceed what they're paying me because of these additions or subtractions to a contract. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you know the lay of the land, you're much more able to be in position to negotiate on behalf of your client when you kind of know where those forks in the road are and what you should be looking for, as opposed to, again, somebody who, yeah, maybe they're an expert in law. But if they're not an expert, as you said, in coaching contracts, they may miss some of those things that could end up being vitally important to a coach, depending upon how things play out at that particular school. We have two more areas to cover. So I want to go back. I want to leave counseling for the last piece. So let me just ask you about helping coaches to prepare for interviews. And we could probably spend a whole podcast on this, but just give me the number one. What's the number one thing if you were going to give advice to a coach out there when they're preparing for a head coaching interview? What's the number one thing in your mind that they should do to prepare for that interview? Is it to work up answers and try to think about what questions are going to be asked? Is it to research the school and what kind of things that they would want the program to have in place when they get there? What's your, what's your number one piece of advice for a coach going into a head coaching interview? Sure. Well, the first piece of advice is don't be a job chaser. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you want, what I want. It matters what the athletic director wants. And so if you don't have a tie to that school, that region, um, don't be sending out your resume or email ADs at every Division I school trying to get a head coaching job. You know, because, because ADs talk, too. And they'll say, well, that person applied for my job. And, you know, they haven't even been out on the West Coast. 
And so, you know, the, the first thing is put your effort and time into jobs that are going to be realistic to you, whether it's you have a connection or it's within your region or it's something that you sincerely feel that you're capable of doing, not because, you know, I, Trust me, I, I interviewed as an AD. I mean, I would get emails and resumes from, you know, uh, and I wasn't in Division One school, but, you know, uh, CYO coaches or <laughs> coaches at college level and whatnot. Like, right, I got so, you. So, they, so you got to understand that ADs are getting inundated with resumes of people who are completely unqualified. So put your effort into attacking and pursuing jobs that you're qualified for, that you have a connection or that fit you based on your background and, and level of experience. Um, in terms of pursuing jobs, it has to be very personalized. It cannot be, you cannot be interviewed for job A and B and expect that you're going to get the same answers for jobs A and B. You cannot send the same cover letter. You cannot, um, you, you can't pursue and gather information and expect that everything's going to be the same. When you, when you learn and you research, and you can have a list of questions. I mean, I send clients a list of over 100 interview questions that they could be asked. You know, maybe they're asked three of them or whatever. But understanding, if you're going to answer the question of what's your offensive philosophy, that you can answer that, but you also have to tailor it and include why your offensive philosophy fit with that current existing roster. So they understand that you've done your research, but also can visualize you as their next head coach doing what you're saying that you're doing. Yeah, and that I makes sense. That, that makes sense. And I think too, you know, from an assistant standpoint, it's you're not a head coach. And AD wants to hire you to be their head coach or is interviewing you to be their head coach. They need to feel comfortable enough that you've handled responsibilities. So whether it's budget, compliance, staff management, uh, whatever it might be that you're not even thinking of now, think about. Because those are the, there's a lot of great coaches, there's a lot of great recruiters. But the things that are going to separate those who get the job and don't is that level of comfortability that an AD is going to have and say, you know what, these two people are great recruiters, but... That person right there, they've they've handled some of those responsibilities that a head coach uh, has to do, and so I feel more comfortable hiring that person. And so just thinking about those things off the court and and making an AD feel comfortable, whether it's through your resume and, and through the interview process. All right, let's jump to the counselor role. What in the last nine months, as we've been dealing with COVID, what have you done to help your clients work their way through that? What have you learned from the experience and what have your coaches learned through this experience of kind of trying to manage this crisis and figure out day to day, whether I'm going to be able to practice, whether I'm going to be able to have a season, how have you helped your clients through that? We'll answer that question. Then I have one more for you before we wrap up. Sure. Well, obviously the last couple of months have been incredibly challenging for coaches and it, has really changed the way that everyone has led and managed and went about their day-to-day -day business. I mean, nothing is normal or nothing is as it, as it used to be. And so we have to adapt and we have to change. And, and some of these changes are good and are going to continue with us even when we get through this. But for me, it was just letting my clients know that if you need to talk, I know you're constantly being a resource to your student athletes who are, you know, you're so focused on their mental health. Know that I'm there for you as you're trying to be there for your student athletes. So I think making them constantly aware and then checking in with them and, and whatnot, I think that's the first piece. The second piece is every school is handling this and, and has been since March completely different. And so with my clients, they'll call me and say, hey, we're dealing with this and this and, and want to talk through it. But I think the other piece of it is letting them know, hey, you're not alone. Like there's other clients and other schools that are doing this too. 
And so it brings a level of comfort to them, knowing when they feel like they're on an island and that they're dealing with stuff that, that other schools aren't, that they really aren't alone. Other schools are dealing with it or handling it the same way. Uh, the third piece is, I mean, we did this a lot, was putting together whether it was Zoom sessions or, or email threads of various situations, <coughs> excuse me, um, where clients can be able to bounce ideas off each other, whether it was how you're helping your student athletes adjust back to school or how you're doing workouts now when you're supposed to be wearing masks and gloves and, uh, and various different things and, and create these large email threads where clients are basically just emailing each other and saying, hey, this is what we're doing here, this is what we're doing here. And so that way they can help each other to do it. And, and so the other, the last piece I'll say is, you know, when we went through and, and obviously we're still going through it, but the issues revolving around social justice, being able to put together a Zoom session for all our clients that they could get on and discuss how they're helping their student athletes through this and working through it, especially for some of the, the white head coaches, because when everything is so sensitive and, and heightened, everyone would obviously say, I, I don't know how you feel, but they want to help their African-American student athletes through this. And so just being able to, to discuss how they're doing that, but also hear from our African-American head coaches and black head coaches on, you know, hey, the, these are some ways that you can help your, your black student athletes through this. So just being able to be a constant resource and connector to, to help the clients through these things. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I always say that I feel like coaching is such an isolating profession. It's so easy to get caught up in your team, your situation, your school, what's going on with yourself in the moment that it's super, super valuable to be able to connect with this greater community and to be able to have you as a resource say to them, look, you may be going through this. It may be extremely difficult, but you're not the only one facing this situation. There are other people facing this exact same issue. And here we're going to connect you with them and we're going to learn from the experiences of our entire collective group. And that's going to help each one of my clients, each one of our clients to be able to better manage their own situation where, and again, in a lot of cases, you just feel like I'm on this island and I have nowhere to turn. And so to be able to have your client base and yourself as a resource, I'm sure is tremendously valuable. All right, Brian, before we wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity to share where people can connect with you on social sure. media, with your website, let people know how they can reach out to you, find out more about what you're doing, and then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah. So, I mean, on all my social media platforms, whether it's Instagram or Twitter, every handle is BD Stan or the BDS Agency. And you can even check us out with uh, bdsagency.com as well as an annual conference that we run. Uh, we're entering our fifth year called Head Coach Training Center, which teaches coaches strategies to, it's all focused on off the court development, teaches coaches strategies to uh, obtain a head coach position, whether it's a new position as a head coach or a first time head coach position and then be successful in that role. And so we incorporate search firm executives, athletic directors, administrators, head coaches, uh, sharing on, a, on an intimate level these strategies. So uh, feel free to check out head coach trainings, well, headcoachtc.com. Coaches that are out there listening, uh, please go and check out what Brian has going. A lot of the things that he's talked about today and that he just talked about and shared are things that will be really worth your time to go and check out. And Brian, I cannot thank you enough for taking some time out of your schedule today to join us here on the Hoopheads pod. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. If you have an existing podcast or are looking to launch your own pod but aren't sure where to start, the team at My Podcast Manager can help. Our podcast team works behind the scenes so you can do what you do best. We'll help you launch your podcast, make it sound great, and free up your time for the more enjoyable parts of podcasting. If you're ready to put your podcast editing, production, and promotion on autopilot with a trusted team of podcasting professionals, visit MyPodcastManager.com to get started. 
Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.